Welcome to World Shared Practices Forum. I'm Dr. Jeff Burns, Chief of Critical Care at Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. We're very pleased to have with us today Dr. Murray Pollack. Dr. Pollack is the Director of Outcomes Research at the Children's National Medical Center and Professor of Pediatrics at the George Washington University School of Medicine, all in Washington, D.C. Thank you, Jeff. It's been a pleasure. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm very pleased with this opportunity. Dr. Pollack, uh, welcome. In 1988, you published what is clearly one of the landmark papers in our field. Um, you published in that year the Pediatric Risk of Mortality Score, PRISM. Uh, and in that time uh, across the world, it's now really the preeminent score to assess the risk of mortality. Um, that and the, the so-called PIM score, the Pediatric Index of Mortality, are the two scores that our colleagues around the world rely on to really assess their performance and benchmark against others. Could you take us back to the um, early days of that and um, the severity of illness concept and then building from that uh, outcomes research and what led you to the PRISM score? Uh, severity of illness research probably started with Virginia Apcar, at least in the modern era. She was the first person to quantify physiologic status for patients, in this case it was newborns. The second group that used severity of illness for quantifying physiologic status was, of course, Jeanette and Teasdale when they developed the Glasgow Coma Scale score. Uh, that was remarkable because that score had so much content validity that it was actually used before its full validation ha had been published. It became a worldwide standard even without statistical validation. And finally, getting to the modern era, I give credit to Bill Knauss uh, at G George Washington University uh, for developing uh, the modern day approach to a severity of illness assessment. Uh, and Bill, as you know, uh, uh, was the originator of the Apache score, or acute physiology and chronic health uh, evaluation. What Bill did was take off on the concept uh, that had been around for maybe 10 or 15 years, uh, that the number of organ systems that had failed was directly related to mortality risk. And this slide, uh, which is redrawn from some of the, our pediatric data from the 1980s, clearly indicates that the more organs that have failed, the higher the mortality risk. And a or failed organ system is diagnosed by physiologic dysfunction. So Bill took the concept that physiologic dysfunction could be a quantifier of the number of organ systems that had failed and be a more precise measure of severity of illness. Well, that worked really well. Uh, and uh, it wasn't too long before, both in adult and pediatric intensive care, we were able to very accurately measure uh, mortality risk, predict mortalities, and, and uh, uh, actually begin the assessment of individual ICUs. This slide shows a graph from uh, the mid-1980s where we were able to measure and predict mortality risk in thousands of patients. Uh, Dr. Pollack, how do we think about these scores? In what context do we use them? Well, in most cases, these scores are used for quality assessment purposes. So what we do is we take the data in these scores, which is physiology and other characteristics, and from that, we predict a certain outcome, uh, a certain number of deaths, uh, and compute most, most commonly standardized ratios or standardized mortality ratios. That is the number, of, uh, uh, the number of observed outcomes divided by the number of predicted outcomes. So a standardized mortality ratio is the number of observed deaths divided by the number of expected deaths. Now, when we do that, we can then, and as this slide shows, we can then make certain assessments about the unit, okay? If this is a ICU or if it's not a, not a critical care methodology, we can make certain assessments about the, uh, the program that's being assessed. This slide also shows how important it is to keep as much as possible the separation between what is being assessed uh, the structure and process, and how we're assessing it, physiology and other characteristics. We'd always like to keep those two things as separate as possible. So the next question then becomes, 
how do we think about the scores that are presently available to us? So there's obviously uh, PRISM, uh, the score that you have evolved, and on the day that we're speaking, indeed in publication would be its fourth generation of the pediatric risk of mortality score. Uh, there's the pediatric index of mortality, which is now, as we speak, in its third generation. And indeed, there are some colleagues, especially perhaps in the United States, who utilize the so-called FIS database or the pediatric health index uh, score or system. Um, how do we think about these, um, these various methodologies? Can you take us through them? Sure. Uh, well, Jeff, I like to think of these methodologies in the, in the framework of an outcomes research. Uh, a framework, and that gives us a way to think about the various important components of the scores. So first is the population. So the, whenever a score is developed, the population from which it's developed becomes a standard. It doesn't make it a, the best standard or the worst standard, it is a standard. The second thing to think about is what are the predictor variables that are going into the score, the independent variables. Now, that's really important because you want to make sure you're measuring what you think you're measuring. And if you include the wrong variables in, a, in your predictive variables, you'll come out with errors. The third thing is, is the outcome relevant? Okay, It makes no sense to predict an outcome that isn't, isn't relevant to what, what, we're, what we're doing. And finally, the interpretation is important. And interpretation is really something that's under appreciated. We're used to using uh, scientific significance for what's important in, in uh, evaluations, uh, the p-value of 0.05 or less. In fact, it could be that when you're using these scores uh, for assessing quality, that a significance level of 0.1 or 0.2 or 0.3 might be very, much, very important to you. I would like to use that framework to assess both PIM3, uh, FIS, and, the most, and PRISM, and get into the problems in PRISM and why we have redone the, the score. Now, PIM3 was recently published, and it's a really fantastic uh, publication. This was a, 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 a group that used over 50,000 patients to develop the PIM3 score in four countries, the United Kingdom, Australia, New Zealand, and Ireland, over, I think, 60 uh, uh, units, uh, including 16 that were adult uh, units that, that uh, hospitalized uh, children in those units as well. The other thing about this population is that it used national registries. So this was a, the, 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 these countries collected their data uh, sort of automatically, so it was all, all comers. There are diagnostic codes in the national registries, and important for my current thinking about physiologic uh, predictors is that it included readmissions to the ICU. Now, a couple of things to think about. For those, especially in the United States, but in, but in other countries as well, what is the standard? Okay, we really don't know very much about these 60 units. And we really, and it's a, a set of countries that while it's clearly excellent care in these countries, we don't know whether that's the right standard, for example, in the United States or for another country. The predictive variables in PIM are the diagnostic codes okay, from these national registries. One variable that I would like to mention, one of the physiologic variables, PaO2 divided by FiO2, which is a variable that I find problematic. It's problematic because FiO2 is difficult to measure. Of course, if you're on a face mask, one never knows what the FiO2 really is, the tracheal FiO2. So in PIM3, they require either intubation or that the patient be in a head tent. That creates an age bias to the variable because head tents are used in infants. It also includes mechanical ventilation as one of the predictive variables. I also have a problem with that because what we're trying to assess in quality assessment is whether or not therapy is correctly applied to correct physiology and save lives. And so you shouldn't be using therapy to assess therapy. Okay. And finally, the observation time for PIM3. And while it's phenomenal that it's only up to one hour into the ICU course, actually the fine print is that it's 
from the time the ICU team makes contact to the patient to up to one hour. Now, what's important in quality assessment is that we do not create an institutional bias, okay, that we bias or favor institutions in the way we collect our data. Because if, if one institution routinely sends their critical care transport team, uh, critical care doctors out on their transport team, they will have a long observation time. If another institution does not send their critical care doctors on a, on a transport, then they will have a short observation time. The longer the observation time, the more chance for an abnormal variable is collected. Now, the outcomes in PIM3, again, they were very good goodness of fit and area under the curve, uh, the curve d data for, for PIM3. But in appropriately, the authors of, of PIM3 uh, created categories to assess the, the uh, performance in, uh, in uh, subgroups of their population. They had poor performance in the neurologic uh, group and marginal performance in the miscellaneous group, which includes injuries, a big thing at least in the United States, and respiratory uh, illnesses. So in three of the six diagnostic categories, they actually had marginal or poor performance. Now, the importance of that is that it implies that institutions which have a different diagnostic mix than this population sample may not work as well with PIM. And finally, in the interpretation group, I still have to ask, what is the standard? Is this, is this group the standard? Should it be used in the United States and other countries or not? I think everyone who uses PIM3 has to ask themselves that question. Is this the group that I wish to compare my ICU to? Now, the Pediatric Health Information System, or FIS, uh, is a completely different score. Uh, this is a discharge score uh, based on an administrative database uh, that uses the concepts of disease staging uh, and ICD-9 codes. It's a very, very large data set. That's very, very good. But as again, if it's a discharge data set, it clearly has a reimbursement bias to the coding. It's interesting that as many times as the uh, mortality risk computations from the FIS database has been used, I have never seen the methodology validated. So while we trust groups like the Children's Hospital Association to, to be rigorous about that kind of data, we should see that before we trust those, those predictions. PRISM isn't perfect either. I don't want to. I don't want to sit and, and criticize PIM or FIS, and not not criticize Prism as well. Uh, so Prism uh, is very much uh, up in the air uh, in terms of many of its characteristics until this last group of publications that that we have uh, coming out. First, uh, Prism was a group of volunteer ICUs. We really don't know who those units are. Whether it's in the United States or elsewhere, we have to wonder, is that the right? We, ha we would like to know what are these units we're being compared to that have created the uh, standard for the algorithms. The other thing about uh, PRISM that's always bothered me is that it included readmissions. Now, what do I mean by that? I think including readmissions, and PIM does this as well, is probably the wrong way to go. When we discharge a patient from the ICU, that discharge is definitely, the appropriateness of that discharge is definitely a quality metric. If we discharge a, a patient appropriately, most of the time they'll leave the ICU, get, get better, leave the hospital, go home. If we discharge them inappropriately, okay, they may get sick, come back to the ICU. If they get sick again because we discharge them too early, that's bad care. But we have actually advantaged ourselves in, the, in a system which includes all readmissions as separate patients. In the first case, we discharged the patient early. We got credit for a good outcome. Okay. The patient comes back. They are sicker than they were before. They have a higher severity of illness score. So if they live, we get credit for saving them. And if they die, well, they were sort of expected to die because their physiology was bad and their predicted mortality was higher. So I believe very strongly that we should transition 
to a, ho to a hospital discharge uh, uh, outcome. Second, what were the predictive variables? Well, the foundation was very clear. Uh, it was severity of illness, very much in the Apache uh, methodology of assessing the number of organ systems that, that had failed. Uh, it is severity of illness adjusted for other factors such as diagnosis, age, and comorbidity, but those adjustments are made for the mortality risk, not for the severity of illness score. There are no therapies in PRISM, and PRISM score uses the first 12 hours of care. The old PRISM score did. Now, we chose 12 hours of, of care many years ago for a very specific reason, because we, and we published this, that we had tested what the length of time that would be necessary to avoid any institutional bias in, in, in the number of tests for the PRISM variables. So that turned out to be 10 hours, so we rounded it off to 12. Okay, to make sure that we did not bias any institution, because they were these institutions were assessing their quality, and we didn't want to, to bias them based on just a practice pattern of how often they got laboratory measurements or measured vital, vital signs. Now, what is the outcome in PRISM? The PRISM outcome and PIM and FIS is mortality. The fact is that these days, mortality rates in pediatric ICUs are very, very low. And as we have transitioned over time to focusing more on improving our outcomes by reducing morbidity, I firmly believe that we must transition our thinking for these quality scores to, what, to including morbidity and mortality as outcome measures. And finally, in how to interpret this, again, as I've said before, we don't know very much about the units that, that are being used as a standard. It is only U.S. performance, so if you don't know who's, what the characteristics of the units are, then people in other countries really don't know very much about it. Uh, and there's lots of unknowns about the current state of PRISM. I wonder if I could turn now to our colleagues around the world and ask a question. Could you first please state your city and country location? And the question is this. In your pediatric intensive care unit, how do you assess mortality risk? That is, do you routinely utilize any of the standard scoring measures, such as PIM or PRISM? So, um, Murray, uh, I know I probably speak for our many colleagues around the world when I ask this. Um, I'm often asked by a family, you know, what's the risk that my child's going to die? Is it a useful um, exercise, uh, and is it a wise exercise? to go back to the risk of mortality score that you're using, whether it's PRISM or PIM, and say, well, according to our best analysis, the score says it's this. Is that something that you do? Is that something that you would recommend? Uh, Jeff, I've never recommended that we use a PRISM on individual patients uh, for a variety of reasons. First, the assessments must be made by individuals, by doctors, okay? Doctors and nurses take care of patients. They are at the bedside. They are the final arbiter of how sick that patient is. Second, we all have to recognize that these scores are derived from populations. Okay? They, they are not necessarily applicable to an individual patient. If I tell someone that their mortality risk is 10%, one in 10 of those patients is going to die if my risk assessment is accurate. But I don't know which one from the score. I would rely on the caregivers to use their own knowledge to make that assessment of how sick the patient is. Um, well, Murray, you've made a very strong case that um, despite the fact that we do have these rigorous uh, assessments of uh, the risk of mortality, that the real goal now should be moving towards really measuring and better understanding morbidity so what are the morbidity measures that are available to us, and how should we think about them? Uh, Jeff, I think this is the new paradigm of outcome assessment in ICUs. That is, including morbidity as well as mortality uh, in, in our outcomes. Critical care has expanded its emphasis to include minimizing morbidity as well as saving lives. And people in the audience know very well all the efforts that they do to minimize a secondary injury with head injury, to minimize ventilator damage with respiratory failure, uh, et cetera. Uh, 
So our contention, or my contention, and, and the contention of others is using mortality without morbidity as a primary outcome measure in ICU assessments, especially when we're assessing quality, reduces the validity and maybe actually promoting errors in the way we're assessing quality of care. We looked for methods in adult medicine to measure morbidity that we could apply to children. The adult methods that we looked at included activities of daily living, and that is things like bathing, toileting, locomotion, eating, and the Glasgow Outcome Scale, again done by Jeanette and Teasdale many years ago. Uh, the pediatric equivalent of, adaptive, of activities of daily living is adaptive behavior. Uh, ad adaptive behavior is not an easy thing to use in a large study. And the pediatric equivalent of the Glasgow Outcome Scale was the pediatric cerebral and overall outcome categories, or the POPC and PCPC. So we looked at the POPC and the PCPC, and the audience will know that, that these derive mostly from the research of Dr. Deborah Pfizer. And there were categories 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1 being normal, 2 being mild, 3 being moderate, 4 being severe, 5 and 6 vegetative and dead. Uh, it turned out that, that Dr. Pfizer uh, did some pretty good uh, assessments of the POPC and the PCPC uh, with some neurological, with some uh, neuropsych testing. And this slide shows a, a, a uh, figure from one of her publications, which illustrates how she, the performance of the POPC and the PCPC against the Bailey. Uh, and what you can see is that clearly there is a difference in the Bailey scores for the POPC and PCPC categories. But if you look at the overlap, the standard deviations in each of those categories, it is remarkably large. And we worried that if we were to use the POPC and the PCPC categories in large sample sizes, we would need even larger sample sizes because of the lack of precision. So we also noted that Dr. Pfizer had given us her interrated reliabilities uh, uh, in some of her early publications. And there's a quote on this. It says, using standardized cases, agreement across consensus values range from 76% to 86% within one neighboring class. I think we forgot to read that sentence very carefully. Because what it means is that while there's validity to the POPC and PCPC, the precision is inadequate uh, for the uses that we wanted to put this tool to. So our result, uh, our, our effort, and this was done in the uh, Collaborative Pediatric Critical Care Research Net Network, or often called CAPCORN, uh, we created the Functional Status Scale score. It was a formal co consensus process of eight pediatric disciplines, pediatricians, neurologists, developmental psychologists, physiatrists, nurses, intensivists, and respiratory therapists, uh, high-risk behaviors, uh, High-risk patients were assessed, about 800 of them, with the FSS. And the caretakers, the bedside caretakers, uh, used uh, an, an adaptive behavior scale score called the ABIS-2 uh, to assess their adaptive behavior. So we were able to validate the functional status scale score against an adaptive behavior score. Uh, what, what we found was that FSS was strongly correlated with the ABIS-2. Uh, one of the things we did further was that we've adopted, at least for our current studies, a new morbidity as a change in the FSS, a functional status scale, of three or more. Now this slide gives, shows the functional status scale, and this was published in 2009 in pediatrics. And what's important is not the details in this slide, but to just understand that the domains of the functional status scale are the mental status, sensory, communication, motor, feeding, and respiratory. So that's kind of the pediatric equivalent of a, activities of daily living, at least for young children and, and infants. And we recommend using the FSS. We think it's a very powerful new way of assessing morbidity or functional status for large pediatric studies. The CAPCORN network uh, undertook a study to predict morbidity from critical care. 
uh, as well as mortality. And in the process, we studied 10,000 patients. From the first 5,000 of those patients, we actually went back and measured morbidity and mortality in our sample. And it was really remarkable. The mortality rate in these seven institutions in the CAPCOR network was 2.5%. But the morbidity rate was twice as high. Okay. We are creating or, uh, many more morbidities than mortalities in critical care. Now, this is on hospital discharge, so we don't know what their long-term outcomes are, and that's uh, a, a fruitful effort of further research. Uh, but it is important that while we may have a mortality rate of only 2.5%, we have a mortality and morbidity rate of about 7 plus percent in our ICUs. I wonder if I could turn now to our colleagues around the world and ask a question. Could you first state your city and country location? And the question is this, do you formally measure morbidity in your intensive care unit? And if so, do you use the functional status score or do you use some other measure of morbidity? So we, we developed the functional status scale, which we talked about. The next thing we needed to do, even before we went into our, our the, the predicting morbidity, was to modernize PRISM. So earlier we talked about some of the deficiencies of, of PRISM in the modern era. So we set out to improve that. The first thing we did was minimize the observation time for the PRISM variables. We had talked before that it was at least 10 to 12 hours to make, make sure there was no institutional bias. We reassessed that and found that if we used a time period from minus two hours for laboratory tests done before admission to plus four hours for physiologic variables, that that minimized this time and better separated our prediction variable, our variables, our independent variables, from what is being assessed quality of care. The second thing we did was we only included the first PICU admission. If people were subsequently admitted, we did not include that second admission. The third thing that we did was we created a classification system for infants uh, three months or less that used an a priori system. So it removed all the bias from assigning whether or not we would use the admission time period for, for assessing physiologic status or the post-intervention, post-operative time period for assessing physiologic status. We understood that there was a new thing that was happening in critical care. And that is that many infants, especially in cardiac units, were being admitted to, their, to the ICU prior to their surgeries or, interven or catheter interventions. Well, that's obviously not part of their critical care uh, period and is not going to give us accurate predictions for their, for their post-intervention procedures. We use only outcomes from at discharge. And in the study, we used new functional morbidity defined as an increase of an FSS of three or more. Uh, the primary aim of the topic study, Trichotis and Outcome in Pediatric Critical Care, was to develop and validate a predictor of three or more outcome states from pediatric intensive care. Death, survival without reduced functional status, or survival uh, with change uh, functional status. And the hypothesis that goes along with that is that new functional morbidity is associated with physiologic dysfunction assessed in the first few hours of pediatric intensive care in a manner that is very similar to the association of mortality with physiologic dysfunction. The data we, we, uh, included 10,078 patients from the seven sites in the CAPCOR network. Uh, hospital outcome was the outcome. It was a NICHD uh, CAPCORN study, uh, and the data was collected from December 2011 through, uh, to April 2013. So it's pretty contemporary. Now, this slide and the next slide really give, you, give us the main features of this study. So in this slide, the dichotomous fit, that is survival death outcome, uh, is shown in the dashed line, and the trichotomous fit, that is trichotomous logistic regression, is shown in the solid line. PRISM score is on the horizontal axis, and risk of mortality is on the vertical axis. 
And what should be evident to the viewer is that there's very little difference in the risk of mortality between the dichotomous logistic regression and trichotomous logistic regression uh, for risk of mortality. It really doesn't matter which method we use. But it's very interesting with morbidity, those picture changes completely. So as in the last slide, PRISM score is on the horizontal axis. The risk of morbidity, not mortality, but morbidity is on the vertical axis. Dashed line is the dichotomous fit, that is morbidity or no morbidity. And the trichotomous fit is in the solid line. In the dichotomous fit, what we can see is that as physiologic dysfunction increases, the risk of morbidity increases in a manner very similar to mortality. When we model morbidity with mortality as well as morbidity, the trichotomous model in the solid line, what we see is that morbidity risk increases to a certain point, and then it falls off in this inverted U-shaped curve. That is, as patients begin to die, their, their morbidity risk goes away. So we see that there's a complex interrelationship between morbidity risk and mortality risk, but both of them are related to uh, physiologic status. Now these slides were done just with PRISM versus the outcome. There's no covariates. There's nothing to make these lines better or worse. They're just a pure as association between physiologic status and the, more, and the risk. What we found was that we could very accurately model uh, prediction of morbidity and mortality simultaneously. And this slide does show the, the variables that were, are included. Uh, so age, admission source, cardiac arrest, cancer, trauma, primary system of dysfunction and admission, FSS. And PRISM variables, we divided them into neurologic and non-neurologic PRISM variables. Uh, so these are more or less the same variables that have come out in, pr in PRISM scores in the past. The goodness of fit test was excellent for these models. And here we're just showing the goodness of fit test. And I really want to focus on the new morbidities because we, we know that we can predict mortality pretty well. And so what's circled here is the new morbidities uh, in the validation set. That is about 2,500 of these 10,000 patients. Uh, 61 deaths were observed and 67 0.1 were predicted, but more importantly, 112 morbidities were observed and 113.6 were predicted. Chi-square for this three-tiered three uh, goodness of fit test was excellent. We also looked at the receiver operating characteristic curves and the area under these curves. Uh, dead or alive, the area under the curve was 0.89. And again, this is for hospital outcomes, so this is about the same as the old PRISM score or the PIM score. For uh, death or new morbidity versus a good outcome, the AUC for this was 0.77. And for new morbidities versus all other outcomes, the AUC was 0.7. Now, I'd just like people to become, begin to get familiar with when we plot those two-dimensional ROC curves in three dimensions, because we have three outcomes, what we get is an area, a, a volume under the surface curve, so the so-called 3D ROC curve. Now, if the viewer looks at uh, the margins of this, of this figure, they'll see the ROC curves from the previous slide. And the shaded triangle inside the, the figure is the 50% chance line that they're used to seeing in ROC curves. So the, this is a measure of discrimination for a multiple outcome predictor. And in this case, the volume under the surface is about 0.5 for both the validation and the estimation uh, sets. Chance is only 0.167. So it's an excellent predictor of the three outcomes. Uh, I hope we'll be seeing more of this as people begin to apply uh, three or more outcome predictors to quality of care studies. What we did also was we took all the different types of uh, categories of patients just to make sure we were predicting well. Our trichotomous outcome predictor works well in all different types of scenarios. Finally, the seven sites in the uh, CAPCORN network did allow themselves to be 
tested. Uh, and what we found was that there was more variability in these seven sites with this new predictor than we thought. Four of the sites had standardized morbidity ratios different than predicted. Two of them had standardized mortality ratios different, predicted, different from predicted. And three of them had an overall assessment different than predicted. What this implies very strongly is that using multiple outcomes, three outcomes, morbidity, mortality, uh, uh, as well as survival, may be a more sensitive indicator of differences in quality of care. So is it a fair summation of this study to say that uh, not only do physiologic uh, predictor variables in the first four hours of admission predict mortality, but so too physiologic instability and physiologic predictor variables in the first four hours of admission also predict mor morbidity? Yeah, what happened, what we're, what we're confirming is that what happens in those first few hours of critical care is very, very important. It's not the only important time, but those initial hours of care are when much is determined okay, uh, for, for critical illness, uh, whether it's m mortality, which we've known for a long time, but also morbidity as, as well. That this morbidity is a place on the path road to death, okay? That some people don't make it to death, and that's a good thing, but they may stop at morbidity. And our job is to continue to improve our care so that they stop on that road before we get to morbidity. Uh, Dr. Murray Pollack, it's been terrific having you here today. I know I speak for colleagues around the world in uh, thanking you for all that you've done to advance our field and um, continuing to advance our field with your most recent publications. Thank you, Jeff. It's been my pleasure.